chapter 18, verses 9 through 14 today. And the King James text reads, And he spoke this parable unto certain, which trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. Two men went up into the temple to pray, the one a Pharisee and the other a publican. The Pharisee stood and prayed thus with himself, God, I thank Thee that I am not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this publican. I fast twice in the week. I give tithes of all that I possess. And the publican standing afar off would not lift up so much as his eyes unto heaven, but smote upon his breast, saying, God be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For every one that exalteth himself shall be abased, and he that humbleth himself shall be exalted. Amen. If you'll bow your heads with me one more moment. Father, once again, God, we come boldly before the throne of grace as the Word of God declares it's our privilege as children of God. Master, once again, Lord, it is the Lord's day, and we stand today ready to hear and to receive from your Word. Lord, as the little birds in the nest who rely upon their parents to feed them, even so today our soul is nestled in the house of God waiting to receive nourishment from heaven. Master, I make myself available to you today. I ask God that you would anoint the messenger, that you would help me this hour, O oh God, to deliver the word of the Lord to the people of God. And I ask God that you would help me do so in a fashion that is pleasing in your sight and that is effective in the hearing of your people. Help me, Lord, today to deliver every word in a timely, accurate fashion. Help me not to speak out of turn. But, oh God, today, let me today give to the people of God that which their soul needs. We ask it all in none other than Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. Praise God. You know, I doubt that there are very many of us in this room and very many that are watching by reason of the internet today who haven't had the experience of going by an individual standing at the end of an exit ramp. And they look all emaciated, you know, skinny and taut and they're dark circles under their eyes and their hands are rough and you can tell their face looks like aged leather. And I doubt there are very many of us, Bill, that hadn't at some point in time gone past somebody like that and looked at him and thought, boy, man, I'll tell you what, that poor thing looks just horrible. Boy, I mean, what a mess she is. What a mess he is. I remember when I was a kid, my grandmother could be awful judgmental. She could be awful rough. Of course, the funny thing is, she tended to be harder on the saint than she did the sinner. <laughs> Isn't that funny how so many Christians can pick one another apart, and yet they can actually have a little bit of compassion for somebody outside of the church. But bless God, they have no compassion for anybody inside the church. My grandmother used to have a little phrase she used frequently when you'd see somebody and you'd say something that was a little harsh or a little rough and she'd say, but for the grace of God, there go I. 
if it wasn't for God's grace, that person could be me. Am I telling the truth? Uh -huh. You look at the illustration I have today for my message, and there sits a man with a drink in his hand and a bottle of liquor held to his head. He's obviously hurting. He's frustrated. He's struggling, and he's responding to his pain and his struggle with alcohol. But for the grace of God, there go I. You know, I thank God that even during the few years that I was out of church, I never turned to alcohol as my answer. I thank God for that because that would have just been another battle I'd have had to fight when I came back, right? Amen. Now, there are some of us that understand wrestling with addiction. There are some of us that understand how hard it is once you pick up the bottle to put it down. Or once you pick up the needle to refuse to pick up another, or once you've snorted a line, how hard it is to back away and say, no, thank you, the next time a line is offered to us. Some of us understand that. I can honestly say today, I thank God that those issues have never been a part of my life. Even when I was out of church, I had enough of God in me. I had enough of holiness preaching in me that alcohol was not anything, Bill, that I turned to for recreation. I could have a wonderful time without drinking. To this day, I can have a marvelous time without drinking. I can go to a party and have the time of my life. I had a friend of mine one time invite me to a cast party. He had been part of a uh, Broadway play or an off-Broadway play and it closed in New York City. The play closed and he was having a cast party. All the cast and crew were going to be there and he invited me to be part of his party. And I said, well, if it's a cast party, why in the world would you invite me? He said, because you're so much fun. Now, I was out of church at the time, so I was maybe a little more fun than I am now. I don't know. He said, you're so much fun. He said, I think you'd be a good addition to, to my party. So I attended the party, and the cast and crew were all there, all these you know, Broadway, off-Broadway actors, and all these crewmen that worked the stage and the lights and all this other stuff. And at one point, I was on the back patio, and I was talking to a couple of people, and as is my custom even today, I start being the class clown. I start, you know, trying to be funny. And next thing you know, I got a few people laughing. Before too long, Johnny, a couple more people got around me. And as my audience grew, so did my act. And I begin to get these people laughing. And then all of a sudden, a few more people. Next thing I know, I must have had 20 people literally standing around me in a, almost in a full circle. And I'm just carrying on, just talking the way I talk, doing the way, you know, I get on a roll. And they're laughing their full heads off. And after a while, when I finally decided to quit my set... <laughs> About three or four of those people come up to me and say, Charles, can you give me your business card? I said, well, yeah, okay, but why? They said, well, I'd like to hire you when I have a party. I said, hire me? What are you going to hire me to do? They said, well, we're going to hire you the same way Stephen hired you. We're going to hire you to entertain. I said, honey, Stephen didn't hire me to entertain. Stephen's a friend of mine. He was adorable. He and I have been friends. We're still friends on Facebook to this day. Been friends for years and years and years. And I said, he didn't hire me. I said, I'm just a friend of his. And he invited me to be part of the party. She said, uh, and these people said, oh, I can't hardly believe this. And my God, the way you were doing it was like you were a professional. I like to make people laugh. I've never needed alcohol. I've never needed drugs. I've never needed anything to help me have a good time. And I thank God for that. And you know, it'd be easy for me to look down on people who do use alcohol to self-medicate. It'd be easy for me to look down on people 
who use drugs. It'd be easy for me to look down on people who have addictions and issues that I've never had to wrestle with my entire life. And a lot of Christians do exactly that. But for God's grace, there am I. But for God's grace, I could be that very person. I could be in that very self-same condition. Why in the world can believers not understand that it's the grace of God that's going to get us into heaven and not anything we've done ourselves? Amen. Jesus said in our primary text today, and he spake this parable unto certain, listen, which trusted in themselves that they were righteous. There are a lot of people who put their trust and their confidence in themselves. Yes. And they judge themselves righteous, listen, not because of the blood of the Lamb that's been applied to their life, not because of the grace of God that accepts them as perfect in spite of their every imperfection. But they trust in themselves because they have convinced themselves that there is some standard of righteousness that they meet. And therefore, I am able to have every confidence that I have done everything necessary <laughs> to stand before God and claim righteousness wrong baby the word of God said all our righteousness all our righteousness it doesn't say all our perceived righteousness no it says all our righteousness in other words is it really righteousness yes it is but all our righteousness is before the Lord as filthy rags in other words, no matter how much clean you got, <laughs> you still got dirt. Amen. That's right. You ever, you ever washed a shirt? Tommy and I were going to go out Saturday, and I put on a T-shirt, you know. Now, it's been through the laundry I don't know how many times. It was clean. It smelled good. Oh, yeah, I could smell that fabric softener, you know. I was getting a buzz from my downy. <laughs> And Bill, as clean as it was, I went over to fix my hair in the mirror, and there stands my booby. And my booby said, uh, you got a spot here, and you, you got a spot there. I said, okay. He said, well, aren't you going to take it off? I said, why? It's clean. Hello now. It's clean. He said, I don't care how many times I try. He said, I've done everything I can to get them spots out. I can't get those spots out. But the shirt is clean. But depending on the eye that's looking at it, it's not clean. Do you follow what I'm telling you? Got news for you, honey. No matter how much your hair piles up on your head, no matter how long your sleeves are, no matter how long your skirts are, whether or not you go to the bar rooms, whether or not you go to the nightclubs, whether or not you attend movies or go to school dances, I got news for you. When God, the holy God of heaven, looks at you, he can still see dirt. He can still see stains. He can still see filth. He can still see sin. If it wasn't for the grace of God, right. not a one of us would make heaven. Mm -hmm. Doesn't have anything to do. Trusting in yourself, you're a pretty foolish person to put confidence in yourself rather than in the grace of God. You know, it's funny, a lot of people listen to this preacher and they listen to the message that I preach and they listen to the theology that I expound upon and they can't argue with one word of it. Until... 
until I say this applies to the LGBT person every bit as well as it applies to the divorcee. This applies to the LGBT person every bit as much as it applies to the alcoholic. This yes. applies to the LGBT person just as much as it applies to anybody. Oh, all of a sudden, Tommy, they get all offended. And, oh, no, I can't go for that crap. I can't accept that garbage. Yeah, but funny, you accept every word I say right up until that point. Sure do. Because you understand that if it wasn't for God's grace, there's sin in your life. And, honey, just because you don't broadcast it out in the center of Broadway, it don't mean it ain't there. That ain't right. Got news for you. I don't care how holy somebody looks on the outside. I guarantee you there's something that ain't right on the inside. It's there. Mm -hmm. My Lord, have mercy. Jesus said, two men, let me give you an example. By reason of a parable, two men went into the temple to pray. And one was a Pharisee and the other a publican. The Pharisee stood and prayed. And what did he do? Well, he bragged to God about how good he was and how many right things he did and how he didn't do wrong things. Well, i got news for you there, Mr. Pharisee. I read your list of the wrong things that you said you didn't do. You said, I'm not as other men are, extortioners, unjust, adulterers. Or even as this publican. Um, I didn't see on that list liar. I didn't see on that list murderer. Hello now. See, you listed all the things that you don't do wrong, but uh, there are things that you can do wrong that I didn't happen to see on your list. Is it possible that maybe you do those things? Then he goes in, Bill, and tells us the good things he does. I fast twice in the week. I give tithes of all that I possess. Oh, he brags about fasting. Oh, I've known people in this church. We've had people in this church who brag about fasting. I've known people that were part of this church who Every once in a while, we'd go out to eat after church, and they would very piously and with great humility push away the menu and say, No, brother, I'm fasting. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Uh, got news for you. The pastor uh, is exposed to a lot of things that you may never be exposed to in that person's life, and I can tell you some things that go on in their life that ain't altogether right. Now, I'm not about to do that. I'm not about because that wouldn't, be, wouldn't make any sense. It wouldn't be the right thing to do. But my point is this. I guarantee you for all their fasting, there's stuff in their life that's wrong. I guarantee you for all their fasting, there's stuff in their life that's sinful. I guarantee you for all their fasting, for all this righteous conduct, there's an equal amount or more of unrighteous conduct. I remember one man I had in my first church many years ago. Because y'all, every time I say something, people always start looking around at folks they remember being a part of our church. And I've tried to tell you over the years, I've pastored a whole lot more than we've had in this little church. So a lot of times when I'm talking, you know, I'm, I've got experience that goes way beyond the last 18 years in Dallas, Texas, okay? I pastored a man in my first church some 31 years ago. And I'll never forget, Johnny, I went to his house one time and we were doing something. We were having like a church event or something, like a picnic or something. He had a large property and he invited us to come out and do it at his house. And at one point, he asked me to go and get something like out of his room or something, you know. I can't remember. It's been a lot of years. And as you get older, you know, details tend to fade. Long story short, I went into his room to get, and I passed a big old bowl of condoms. This man was single. 
We don't believe in premarital sex. We don't believe in sex outside of marriage. We were a holiness church. What in the world would this man have a big old collection of condoms sitting there for just because he thought the packaging was pretty? I don't know. Because maybe he accidentally bought them thinking they were chocolate coins. I doubt it. Because he was going to have a party and we were going to water balloon it? I don't think so. Those were awful expensive balloons for a water balloon party. You see, for all his devotion, and he was a good man. I, I mean, he really... And I, and I don't know what he did or if he did. All I'm saying is that certainly didn't suggest anything too good. I remember years ago being part of a church, a holiness church, United Pentecostal. Oh, <gasps> Ooh, sister high hair, get ready, sister, hold your false teeth and grab hold of your bun because you're going to love what I'm going to tell you right now. Remember one time I had to go to a young lady's house in the church for, again, it's been so many years ago, good Lord. This is back in like 87 or so, so it's been a while. I had to go to her house to pick something up or to get something, 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 something. And I knocked on the door and she came to the door and she gave me whatever it was she needed to give me or told me whatever it was she needed to tell me. And then all of a sudden, mind you, this is a long-haired, long-skirt-wearing, Pentecostal holiness girl. All of a sudden, a young man from the church come walking around behind her wearing nothing but a towel around his waist coming out of the shower I'm not making any accusations I'm not trying to make a you know to say they did anything well all I know is from a holiness perspective you don't do that you ain't gonna have a man half naked in your house coming out of your shower no way no how because in holiness you're supposed to abstain from all appearance of evil. You follow what I'm telling you now? My point is, all our righteousness is before the Lord is filthy rags. You can hide your sin. You can stand there and rail against the homosexual all you want to because you see your heterosexuality as being superior and righteous in comparison to their homosexuality. But honey, God looks past your sexuality and he sees every other sin in your life he sees your lying he sees your cheating he sees your uh, practices in business he sees you doing people dirty and doing people wrong am I telling the truth today yep, yep. see people who look upon themselves and they trust in themselves that they're righteous these people have a very weak understanding and a very weak image of God I mean to tell you, they think God's as stupid as a brick. <laughs> if there's anything that I believe and if there's anything that I understand, it is that you ain't going to fool God. You remember the commercial years ago when this lady would feed Mother Nature uh, margarine? And Mother Nature was convinced it was butter. Yeah. And then she'd tell her, no, it ain't butter. See, now some of the young people watching her say, I don't know what he's talking about. What's he talking about? Oh, honey, this ad goes way back before you. <laughs> and you remember when the girl would tell her, no, Mother Nature, that isn't butter. That's margarine. And she said, it's not nice to fool Mother Nature. And the thunder would roar and the lightning. You remember those ads? Yeah. See, you can tell how old the crowd I got here. We all remember. I'm going to tell you a little secret. Honey, if you can't fool Mother Nature, you surely can't fool God. Yes, sure enough. And you better get a right image of God. I'm going to tell you, if you have a right image of God, and if you understand God the way you ought to understand God, you will not sit in judgment of anyone. Because you will fully understand 
that the Bible tells us that that which is done in secret will one day be shouted from the rooftops. I know I've got weaknesses. I know I've got sin. I know I've got things in my life. I, I try to keep it to a minimum. I try, I try to overcome everything I can possibly overcome. I try to live the, the way I can, the, the best I know to live. But I'm not fool enough to sit here and tell you today that I'm not aware of the fact I've got things in my life that I probably shouldn't have. That there aren't times I say things that I probably shouldn't say. I do things I probably shouldn't do. Look at my Twitter feed. I'm sure I can probably find a thousand things there alone that <laughs> condemn me because I probably post a thousand things I shouldn't be posting. But it's born out of sincerity. I, you know, I, it, it, if I post it, it's because I think it and I feel it. Whether I'm right and thinking it or feeling it don't mean nothing, but I'm telling you I think it and I feel it. Jesus said the man who was a publican stood afar off. He, he didn't come to the front of the sanctuary. He didn't come to the altar and just raise his hands full of self-righteousness and declare to the Lord how wonderful he was because I don't go to movies. I don't cut my hair. I don't wear pants. Hallelujah. Glory to God. I don't wear open-toed shoes. Thank you, Jesus. Bless the name of the Lord. I'm talking holiness women. Holiness men. I don't wear a beard, Lord. Hallelujah. I keep my face clean shaven, Jesus. Hallelujah. Glory to God. You'll never catch me at a dance, Lord. publican, he stood way over on the side somewhere. He didn't dare come straight up. Well, I'm going to tell you, when you understand that God ain't fooled by your foolishness, you have a bad habit of kind of standing off to the side. Last thing you want to do is be right in the middle where the spotlight's shining. Am I telling the truth? Not that you're hiding anything, but you just, you don't want to see it. Amen. I know I've got spots on my shirt. I know there were spots on my shirt Saturday. It was clean. It smelled good. It was clean. But I knew they were there. So guess what it did? I kept my jacket on the whole day. All you can see, Bill, was this little part. It looked good. I looked good with my leather jacket on, you know, and that T-shirt. I looked really good. But I wasn't stupid enough to go, because if I had done that, somebody would look at me and say, what a slob. That fool spilled half his lunch down his shirt. No, we know how to keep the dirty spots covered, don't we? But that man stood off to the side. I don't, I, don't wanna, I, don't, I don't want God to shine the spotlight on me. I don't want to have to see the spots on my shirt. And he just said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Lord, I have nothing to hide. You know, one thing this church doesn't do that a lot of affirming churches do, I don't spend a lot of time trying to prove that homosexuality is not a sin. Now, do I understand the issue? Do I interpret the issue the same way that many in the church world do? No, I do not. But I don't spend a whole lot of time trying to say, that this isn't a sin or that isn't a sin because, frankly, it doesn't matter one way or the other. Hmm. I tell people all the time, people say to me, well, this gun, that's a sin. And I say, okay, what if it is? And that's my sin. What's yours? Because I guarantee you, you got it. So while you're worrying about my sin, uh, hello, where are the spots on your shirt? What have you covered with your jacket? Why is it every time you're seen out in public, you've got your coat zipped up to here? Hello now. Why, when you went into the restaurant to eat, did you not take your jacket off? Do you understand what I'm telling you today, folks? The Word of God says in Matthew chapter 
I better put my glasses on or I'll send you to the wrong place. I've done it before. <laughs> Matthew 5, verses 27 and 28. Ye have heard it said, Jesus said. Ye have heard that it was said by them of old time. Thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say unto you, that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. Now Jesus didn't say this to tighten up the rules. I'm going to tell you too many Christians, oh, too many Christians just don't even have a clue how to read the Bible. They're, they're so dumb when it comes to understanding the Word of God, it's not even funny. I got news for you, honey. The parameters of the gospel are not laid out in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. No. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John serve a very specific purpose. They are the testimony of the life, the teachings, the actions of Jesus Christ. That's the purpose they serve. They help us to understand Jesus. What he said, what he taught, what he did. Let me fill you in on another little secret, my good New Testament Christian friend. I love people who call themselves New Testament Christians. <laughs> They're so far from being a New Testament Christian that ain't even funny. Half their beliefs come out of the Old Testament. Well, but Jesus said this and Jesus said that. Aha, uh -huh, he did. You know why? Because until he rose from the grave, all of humanity... Israel in particular was still under the law. He was not presenting anything, listen to me now children, he was not presenting anything outside of the parameters of the law. He was speaking and teaching as, listen to me, you need to understand this, as a Jewish rabbi. That's why men would come to him and say, teacher. That's what rabbi means. They would come to him and say, rabbi. He was teaching as a rabbi. Therefore, everything you see throughout Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John has to be understood within the context and yet under the auspices of the Old Testament law of Moses. So if you try to derive New Testament doctrine from what you see in the Gospels, you're a dope. Let me tell you where New Testament doctrine begins. The book of Acts. Because that's when the church was born. That's when God filled the church with the Holy Ghost. That's when God's men that he had given authority to, to establish the doctrine of the church, that's when they began to speak on behalf of the church in the book of Acts. If your message does not reflect the book of Acts, you are not a New Testament Christian believer. I don't care what you call yourself. What Jesus had to say. When Jesus said, you've heard it said of them of old time. Thou shalt not commit adultery. But I say unto you that whosoever looketh on a woman to lust after her hath committed adultery with her already in his heart. Is Jesus saying, oh, in the New Testament, the rules are even stricter? That's not what he's saying. Not even close to what he's saying. What he's saying is, let me help you understand something about the law. The law says that this action is sinful. 
committing adultery is sinful and you're not to do that. But I want you to understand that above and beyond the letter of the law, God sees what's going on in your heart. And you can do things that are sinful. And you can do things that are wrong. And you can do things that are unrighteous in your heart without ever doing a thing of the world wrong in the flesh. Why would the Lord say this? Why would the Lord expound it? Oh, it's easy. He was trying to help those people who trust within themselves that they are righteous. He was trying to help those people who look at themselves and say, well, I live up to the mandates of the law. I live up to this standard of righteousness. The Lord was basically saying, oh, really, do you? You don't commit adultery. You don't have sex outside of your marriage. Oh, but when you get around that little young thing at your job who really gets your motor running, you sit there and you fantasize and you imagine having a fling with her. And the Lord said, guess what? In God's eyes, you've done it. Line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little, there a little. 1 Samuel 16 and verse 7. But the Lord said unto Samuel, Look not on his countenance or on the height of his stature, because I have refused him. For the Lord seeth not as man seeth. Now I just want to point out to you for a moment how that God speaks of himself in the third person. You know, we make fun of people who say, well, you know, if Bill were to say to us, well, Bill doesn't like beans, or Bill doesn't like tacos, we look at him and think, well, why in the world would he refer to himself in, the, in another, per, you know, from a perspective of another person? Throughout the entire Word of God, God frequently does this. But I say unto you, uh, excuse me, look not on his countenance nor on the height of his stature because I have refused him. This is what the Lord said. He says, for the Lord seeth not. He's not talking about somebody else. He's still talking about himself. Do you follow? But he's using the third person perspective. He said, for the Lord seeth not as man seeth. For man looketh on the outward appearance. But the Lord looketh on what? The heart. So when Jesus said, if you look upon a woman to lust after her, he said, you've already committed adultery with her in your heart. Well, I got news for you, honey. That's where God's eyes are fixed. So while you're trusting in yourself that you're righteous, <laughs> Because your conduct and your behavior is just so impeccable and so above board. God is looking elsewhere. And there's stuff hiding there that ought not to be there. In Romans chapter 2 verse 29 the Apostle Paul writes, But he is a Jew, which is one inwardly. And circumcision is that of the heart in the spirit and not in the letter whose praise is not of men but of God. So what does Paul say? Paul says a real Jew, a real heir of the promise that God gave Abraham, a real offspring of Abraham, he said, is not somebody who's been circumcised in the flesh, Johnny. He said, but somebody whose heart is circumcised. Why? Because God ain't looking at your you who He's looking at your heart. And while the Jewish people rejoice every eighth day of the life of a child, boy child, as the moil circumcises him, and they rejoice over another Jew who is being circumcised and who is being in the flesh, marked as a child of promise, Paul said, 
uh, it's not that. That that causes men to rejoice, he said, but that, that's not what gets God happy. What makes God happy are people who are circumcised in the heart. What is circumcision? Circumcision is an act of obedience. Circumcision is an act of faith in response to God's commandment. Got news for you today. The Word of God teaches that baptism in the name of Jesus Christ is the New Testament circumcision. It's an act of faith in response to in obedience to the commandment of God. 1 Corinthians 14, 25, trying to hurry. And thus are the secrets of his heart made manifest. And so falling down on his face, he will worship God and report that God is in you of a truth. The secrets of his heart are manifest. We've all got secrets on the inside. Doesn't matter how well we keep things going on the outside. How many times do we feel terrible? How many times do we feel depressed? How many times do we feel lonely? How many times do we feel heartbroken? How many times do we feel disappointed or confused or uncertain? And yet, everybody around us says, well, I had no idea he was going through all that. I had no idea he was feeling all that or she was feeling all that. Why? Because on the outside, he or she was keeping a very different face. How many times does someone wind up in the coroner's office with a toe tag? And they're there because they've done something by their own hand. They were depressed. They were struggling. And people around them say, I, I didn't see anything. I, I don't understand how this happened. I, I saw no warning signs. She seemed fine. He seemed fine. Why? Because what's in your heart is not always manifested in your external conduct and in your behavior. Am I telling the truth today? Amen. In Colossians chapter 3, I think it is, verse 15, the Word of God said, And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to the which also ye are called in one body, and be ye thankful. Let the peace of God rule in your conduct, in your actions. No, let it rule in your hearts. I'm going to tell you, you got peace not when you're able to keep a straight face and look like you've got it all together and nothing is bothering you. And you're No, there's a lot of people who look that way and there's a lot of turmoil on the inside. The apostles said, let the peace of God rule in your hearts. Said, oh man, I'm going to tell you, you ain't never had peace till you get it in your heart. When your heart is at peace, honey, you got peace. Word of God tells us, Paul writing to the church at Corinth about the communion exercise and ordinance. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 11, 27-32, Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. For he that eateth and drinketh unworthily, eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. For this cause many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. For if we would judge ourselves... We would not be judged. But when we are judged, we are chastened of the Lord, that we should not be condemned with the world. Paul says, um, you better be careful when you come to the Lord's table and you partake of the Lord's supper. You better spend a little time in self-evaluation. Does that mean if you're not perfect that you're not to partake of communion? No. 
But what Paul's saying is, you better come like that publican who said, Lord, be merciful unto me, a sinner, and acknowledged his sin. Paul said, you better come to him with the right attitude. If you come to him with that, oh Lord, let me tell you how good I am. Let me tell you how holy I am. Let me tell you about all the good stuff I do and all the bad stuff I don't do. If you come to him with that attitude, you're in trouble. Because God sees the spots on your shirt. Amen. You may have your jacket zipped up to your neck. But God sees the spots on your shirt. The word of the Lord said in Romans chapter 3, 19 through 25. Now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in his sight. For by the law is the knowledge of sin. Paul said, if you live up to everything the law asks of you, no flesh will be justified in God's sight. Even if you live up to every rule and every commandment, everything the law says, Paul said, no flesh shall be justified in God's sight. Why? Because for by the law is the knowledge of of sin. The law was not designed to make you holy. The law was designed to help you identify sin. Oh my goodness, I hope you understood what I just said. There's a lot of people that come at us today, and what do they do, Johnny? They start quoting the law. Hallelujah. They start quoting the law. They start quoting the law. They go back to Leviticus. Got news for you, honey. Even if I live up to that rule, I will not be justified in God's sight. That's right. right. Every rule, every commandment, every demand, every edict and mandate of the law was there for one purpose and one purpose only. And it was to help us identify sin. Well, Lord, why in the world would you want us to be able to identify sin so readily? Because then when you're able to identify sin, you can see the spots on your shirt. And when you come before God, you always come before Him. How? Like the publican. Not like the Pharisee. Do you hear what I'm telling you now? Amen. Lord, be merciful unto me. What? A sinner. Oh, I'm going to tell you how many people go to church today and they never, ever, 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 ever look up toward heaven and acknowledge before God that they're a sinner. You see why I don't care to explain why certain things aren't sin? Because it don't matter. Whether it's a sin or it ain't a sin, I'm going to have sin. So are you. So's the fool from the first fundamentalist church who's going to stand there and try to condemn you and I today. He said, For by the law is the knowledge of sin. Verse 21, But now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God which is by faith of Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe. Hallelujah. For there is no difference. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely by His grace, through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in His blood, to declare His righteousness for the remission of sins that are past parents of God, to declare, I say at this time, His righteousness 
that he might be just. Listen. And the justifier of him which believeth in Jesus. Hallelujah. Yeah. But for God's grace. <laughs> it's not about me at all. Oh, hallelujah. Ooh, I want to shout a little. <laughs> oh, when you get this down in your spirit, when you understand this truth of the gospel today, I'm going to tell you, it'll have you shouting. I don't care how quiet a person you may be. Romans 4, 1 through 5, trying to close up, but I got a lot of territory. What shall we say then that Abraham our father, as pertaining to the flesh, hath found? For if Abraham were justified by works, he hath whereof to glory, but not before God. Paul said to the Romans, that if Abraham was justified by, uh, by works, he said, well, he had a lot to brag about, but not before God. Why? Because there was a lot of crap in Abraham's life that God wasn't pleased with. For what saith the Scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. See, if you have to work to make heaven, then you're trying to pay a debt, and grace isn't in the equation at all. But to him that worketh not... But believeth on him that justifieth who? Listen, the ungodly. Wait a minute. Who does Jesus justify, Johnny? The ungodly. Somebody look at me and say, well, you're ungodly. I say, yes, I am. But thank God he justifieth the ungodly. <laughs> Hallelujah. His faith is counted for righteousness. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Galatians 5, 3 through 5, For I testify again to every man that is circumcised, meaning to every Jew, that he is a debtor to do the whole law. So if you approach the law and you try to make heaven on the strength of obeying one rule of the law, you have to follow every rule of the law. You cannot... Approach the law, Johnny, in one single thing and say, I've got to live up to that one single thing without coming under the entire weight of the full law. That's what Paul said. For I testify again to every man that is circumcised that he is a debtor to do the whole law. Christ, listen, is become of no effect unto you. Whosoever of you are justified by the law, ye are fallen from grace. You know those people that like to preach the law at us? You know those people like to preach the law at you and I? Guess what, honey? The fact that they are trying to dig that out of the Old Testament law to apply to you and I, they have put themselves under the weight of the entire law. Did you hear me? They have put themselves under the weight. They don't even know it. And Paul said that they're no longer under grace. The minute you try to deny grace to me, you've denied grace to yourself. The minute you try to apply the law to me, you apply the entirety of the law to yourself. Oh my goodness. I'm going to tell you, this is why the Word of God said, Judge not, least to be judged. Yeah. Don't worry about me. Don't worry about my walk with God. Don't worry about what I do or what I don't do. Don't worry about who I do it with or who I don't do it with. Worry about yourself. And for whosoever, for I testify again to every man that is circumcised that he is a debtor to do the whole law. Christ is become of no effect to you. Whosoever of you are justified by the law, ye are fallen 
from grace. Now listen to verse 5, Galatians 5. For we through the Spirit wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. 1 John 3 and 2, Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when He shall appear, we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. Hallelujah. Johnny, so long as I'm in this body, I'm never going to be everything that God would have me to be. I'm waiting for righteousness by faith. I'm embracing righteousness by faith. I'm living in righteousness by faith. Every ounce of righteousness that I come before God with is not a righteousness that I can take credit for. Every ounce of righteousness I come before God with is the Lord's righteousness. Hallelujah. It's Jesus' righteousness. I, I come before God say, Lord, when you look at me, look at the blood. Hallelujah. When you look at me, look at the cross. When you look at me, see only the Lamb of God slain from the foundations of the world. Because why? Because I'm ungodly. And the Lord says, that's all right. I'm a justifier of the ungodly. Hallelujah. I say, Lord, all I can do, I can't always act right. He said, that's all right. You can believe right. Hallelujah. All I'm asking you to do is believe. Hallelujah. Lastly, today, and now, little children, 1 John 2, 28, abide in him that when he shall appear, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. But for the grace of God, there is no righteousness that I can aspire to. There is no righteousness that I can attain. There is no righteousness that I can demonstrate. There, there is no perfection that is within my grasp. It's, it's impossible. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. That's talking about the church, honey. That's talking about believers. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. The unbelievers are not trying to glorify God. Right. All have sinned. John the Apostle said, if, you, if we say we have no sin, then we make God a liar. And the truth is not in us. So when you look at me and say, well, bless God, you can't be a Christian and be who you are. You can't be a Christian and do what you do. Blah, 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 blah. All I can say to you is, uh, I don't agree. I don't agree. I believe God sees me as righteous. I believe God sees me as holy. I believe God knows I do the best I can within the context of who I am. And I live my life to be a testimony. I live my life to be a witness. There are a lot of things that don't do. There's a lot of places that don't go. There's a lot of things that don't say. But you know what? I don't rely upon any of those things to get me into heaven. The only thing I rely upon is the grace of God. Amen. Hallelujah. But for God's grace. Would you stand with me this afternoon? Amen.